I want to focus on how to face a changing environment. And that's what storms are. Storms change everything. And nothing remains the same. And young people, listen carefully tonight as we go through this. I'm going to move very quickly, but I want you to get a copy of this CD. And our friends in Freeport, our sister church there, this word is for everyone sitting in that place packed out there in Freeport. I want to begin with a few statements that I want you to write down. First of all, make a note of this. The greatest commodity possessed by all humanity on earth is time. And what's amazing about time is that everyone has the same amount. A lot of us don't have the same amount of money, but we all got the same amount of time, 24 hours every day. Time is what I call the currency of life. Currency is what you use to buy things. And you've heard the term spending time. That is a true principle. We spend time. And what you are was purchased by the time you spent. What you are right now, your life. In other words, what you become this new year, 2012, will be determined by how you spend your time. And we're about to change time. We're about to move into another period of our lives. And what's amazing is, whatever you use your time for in 2011 is what you have become today. And I believe that the greatest protection against wasted time is planning. Everybody say planning. The way you take control of time is by planning. Why? Because a plan is the way you control time. You cannot really stop time. You can't even save it. But you can control it. And you control time by making a plan. A plan tells time how you're going to spend it. And without a plan, time is wasted. Many of you, looking back in 2011 have a lot of regrets because you didn't use and spend your time properly. And that could be because you didn't have a plan or you didn't stay with the plan or you forgot the plan. Now let me stress to you then that every new year is an act of destiny handing you a new pen and a blank sheet of life. That's what a new year is. It is time giving you another blank sheet. And destiny is saying, you now have the responsibility to determine what's the next chapter of your life going to look like. We know what 2012 looks like. It's finished. And your chapter may not have been as successful as you would like it to be. But I'm telling you that this new year is God, one more time, giving you a blank sheet of paper and a pen. And he stands on the edge of a new year. And he's saying to you, write again. What will the end of this new year look like? It's totally up to you. Please write this down. God has a plan for your life. That's why God has plans for your life. Because he knows that without a plan, you waste time. And each year is a chapter in God's plan in your life. And I think we need to focus heavily on planning this new year. And I mean planning it now. Because the year is going to be so tumultuous. It's going to be so chaotic. That if you don't have a plan for 2012, the winds of change are going to batter you left and right. Some of you are actually going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your sanity. You're going to lose your marriage. You're going to lose your homes. You're going to lose your cars. You're going to lose your health if you don't get yourself lined up with God's plan. Here's a statement I found very important in the book of Jeremiah when I was 13 years old. And that still controls my life today. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you. Plans declares the Lord, to prosper you and not to harm you. 
plans to give you hope and a future. Then, when you have a plan, you can call on me. That means don't call on me unless you get the plan right. Why? Because when you call on me, you're going to call on me according to the plan to do what I said I planned to do for you. And then I will listen to you. That means if you ain't got no plan, God ain't listening. Then I will hear you, he says. And you will seek and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will manifest myself to you. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. Many of us are in bondage right now to the banks. In bondage to people who we loan, borrowed money from. In bondage to some of the, the organizations that have become our source. And God says, if you follow my plan, I'll set you free from the captivity. I will deliver you from the bondage. When we talk about plans, we got to talk about these storms we got to face. 2011 is going to be the year of the storm. Everybody say the storm. You will remember I said this, I promise. In April, it's going to be so stormy for some of us. You're going to remember. I remember what Dr. Monroe says that night, that there will be some storms. In September, there are going to be some other storms. And I tell you prophetically that the hurricane season and the stormy season of life is about to hit us. What I like about this statement, hurricane season, and we use it here in the Caribbean, but I like it because that means that it's not permanent. Matter of fact, stormy seasons means that storms come and storms go. A hurricane is a storm. A storm is a crisis. Let me define a storm for you. You want to write this down. A storm is a temporary convergence of natural currents and the elements reacting to and affecting the environment impacting the normal course of life. That's a storm. Let me repeat it because you're going to feel this all year in 212. It's a temporary convergence of natural currents and elements reacting to and affecting the environment and impacting the normal course of life. Now notice the word natural is in this definition. Another definition, a storm is a collision of known elements in the unexpected ways. In other words, a storm is the testing of tradition by the unexpected. Storms are natural. They are the convergence of natural things that are already present. Storms don't get anything from outer space. Whatever hurricane is came right from Earth. A tsunami is from Earth. A cyclone is from Earth elements. A hurricane is wind and water and heat. They're always here. We like the wind when it cools us down. We like the water when it gives us drink. We like the rain when it brings life to the plants, but when they converge in a unique way, they can kill us. In other words, a storm is always the natural elements working together in a unique way. That means that storms are not foreign. So what do you do when everything you trusted in collapses in a storm? How do you prepare for a sudden change in your life? And how do you recover when life hits you on the blind side? And some of you know what that feels like. What do you do after a lifetime of hard work and dedication and commitment and loyalty? How do you change your vocation and skills suddenly when they release you from your job? When all your skills that you learned, they don't need anymore. What do you do when the rug is pulled out from under you, as we all know, is happening to so many people? How do you face the family you once left behind to go back home because you couldn't pay the rent and that mortgage and you have to go live with your parents again? How do you deal with these kinds of issues? And many people sitting in this auditorium today and the thousands watching this program, they will tell you that they've had this experience this last year. I'm telling you, it's going to get worse in 2012. I look at the people in Grand Bahama watching this program today. Could you imagine two days before New Year's, they are released from their jobs? It couldn't get no worse than that. 
Well, there are people sitting here who have gone through and are going through terrible things. But what I like about life is God says that as long as the earth endures, there'll be seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter, and there'll be day and night, and these will never cease. Everybody say day. Everybody say night. Everybody say summer. Everybody say winter. God says as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. There will be some dark nights, but there will be days coming afterwards. There will be winter, it'll be cold, but I promise you, he says, there will be summer. Give God a hand for some hope in life. Ezekiel chapter 34, God says, I will bless the people and the places surrounding my hill. Watch him. I will send you down showers in season and there will be showers of what? Blessings. Take a deep breath. Some of you have been going around believing that God's going to bless you all the time. But according to that statement, God said, you ain't going to get blessing all the time. Oh dear. Blessing comes how? Read it out loud. Come on, be honest. In season. Some of you are in a season of plenty right now. Others broke. But let me tell you something about seasons. If you broke now, I guarantee you can't be broke forever. It's just a season of brokenness. Is that a new word? If you're sick right now, that's a season of sickness. Use your faith and say, God, I'm going to make it through this season. On the other side, this sickness is good health and good strong body. There'll be showers of blessing in what? Seasons, he says. In other words, seasons are controlled by God. That makes me very comfortable. Because whether it is raining or sunshine, God is in control. Yeah. Write this down, please. The greatest blessing in life is that life is seasonal. Ecclesiastes 3 says, To everything there is a season, and to every purpose there is only a time under heaven. In other words, everything is seasonal. That means that no matter what you go through, it cannot last. Seasons are important because... Seasons guarantee change. Seasons give hope. Nothing remains the same in a season. Seasons are always temporary. And the key to life is outlasting the season. In other words, seasons give the incentive to plan for the future. Because you know that winter can't stay. So you don't throw away your summer clothes. Is anybody here? When it gets cold, you don't throw away your, your, your swim trunks. Why? Because you know that there's a future after the cold. In other words, seasons are always moving and never respond permanently to a temporary problem. This is very important because when you are in a dark moment, sometimes you think that that's a permanent address. But never make a permanent decision to try and solve a temporary problem. This is what happens in divorce many times in, in, in a marriage. You go through a very tough moment. I mean hell on earth. And believe me, you got a choice. Am I going to make a permanent decision at this point? Or am I going to outlast this season and, and make it through this dark moment? It happens with friendships. It happens with even jobs. It happens with business. Sometimes you want to quit the business. Life is so tough. But everything is seasonal. And that's the encouragement of life. And when you see a storm coming, I want you to understand the nature of storms. Write this down, please. It's a very recent revelation to me. First of all, storms are natural. Everybody say natural. Storms are natural. Number two, storms are temporary. There's no permanent hurricane. There's no permanent earthquake. There's no permanent tsunami. There's no permanent cyclone. They are all temporary. Number three, storms are always moving. Hurricanes, you'll hear them talk about the movie, seven miles per hour. 10 miles per hour, 5, they're moving. Every storm in life is moving. That leads me to point number 5. Storms force change, number 4. Storm force change. That's important. Storms force you to change. <laughs> There's a tree in my yard that was a beautiful tree before a hurricane hit us this year. When a hurricane hit us, my tree was gone. Wow. I missed my tree. So I had to get used to this tree not being there. Knock the top of the tree off. Storms force change. This leads me to number 
Number five, storms restore nature to its original state. Hmm. Some people were overweight until the doctor said. Come on, y'all, anyone can listen to me? You know you was eating too much. You know you were overweight. The doctor said, look, if you don't cut your weight by 20 pounds in six weeks, you're going to die. All of a sudden, you stop eating everything. Why? The storm does what? Restores you back to natural state. Your body says, based on your height and, your, and the size of your, your bone structure, you must weigh 125. But you weigh 200. So the storm comes with a heart attack and, and, and problems with your, with your lungs and your liver. And, and all of a sudden, your body says, look, bring me back to what I am. Don't curse a storm. It comes to bring you back to your sanity. Number six, storms expose weaknesses. There are some trees that look good. Until the hurricane came. You know those trees? They looked beautiful, strong, big. All of a sudden, when they went over, you saw inside was rottening. There are people like that in this place. They look good. But when life hits them, bam, on the blind side, all the stuff you thought they were so strong in is exposed. Storms confirm how strong you are. No matter how much you claim you got faith, storms will test whether you get it or not. Storms reduce you to God again. That's why storms come. They come to reduce you back to God. Some people come so proud, they make so much money, they got all this stuff, all of a sudden, bam! God says, thank you very much. A storm comes to bring you right back down to God. Number nine, storms restore true value. I heard that testimony tonight of a gun to someone's head. And they called for the most valuable thing in their life. Half of the things you got, you don't use. The other half, you don't want. One pillar, one plate, one fork, spoon, knife, a pot, and some food. That's it. You don't need a TV in every room. You don't hardly be home to watch them anyhow. Come on, let's talk about this for a minute. You see, a storm will come to tell you what's valuable again, like your spouse and your children. I heard a man who was sick this year. I spoke to him yesterday. He says, Doc, I'm home with my children. He said, you don't understand. I was close to death door in October. And I promise God this Christmas, I ain't going nowhere. I can kiss my grandchildren again. I can talk to my son again. And he's 35. I'm going to have some time with my daughter. And she's 42. Why? They are valuable to me all of a sudden because I was almost dead. A storm will bring you back to what's important. Don't curse a storm. And 2012, God's going to bring you back to what's important. And number 10, write it down. Storms remind us of our mortality. Storms will tell you, you're going to die. Some folks just escaped death in a storm. You are sitting here today, some of you, by the grace of God. I mean, what you went through in 2012, in 2011 rather, you, you was at death's door. And you are still standing. A storm will just remind you that you ain't all of that. That's why every time I meet somebody who's proud, I tell myself, Dad will take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. There are some folks who think they don't need nobody. Don't worry about that. Dad will take care of everything. So don't be cool around here. I ain't clapping. I ain't singing. You better sing. Yeah. You ain't that cool, brother. That's why God brings storms into our lives to reduce us back to our mortality, to realize that you ain't going to be here forever. I was speaking to Sister Andre. She's here tonight. I said, Andre, your father died just a few days before the new year. Could you imagine? He couldn't, he couldn't make it the next year. And I said, but he lived a good life. He poured his life into our country. You got a, no reason to be ashamed. He was a strong man who served our country. Sir Clifford, darling. I wonder what you're doing. A storm will come to remind you that in everything you gain, all you can take is a box. And all, 
and all them clothes that you so cute, proud of, somebody else waiting for you to die, they're going to wear all your clothes. So you better get it straight in 2012 and get back to what's important. It's people and God and family and worship. Number 11, write this down. Storms deflate pride. There's some folks in here who you know. They never used to speak to you, you know. But they speaking now. Why? Job gone, life gone, car gone, bicycle gone, everything gone. All of a sudden they won't be high, high, high. Storms will reduce you from your pride. Amen. Tell your neighbors, stay humble. And number 12, write this down. Storms point you to God. They take you back to divinity. I heard on CNN today, uh, the, the weatherman came on. He said, he said, you know, 2011 was a horrible year for the world in natural disasters. And then he said at the end, I wonder if man will ever be able to control nature. Never. Never. That house that you spent all that money on, one hurricane. Roof gone. Where the roof gone? Jesus, Lord, the roof gone. Life is that fragile. And that's why 2012 must be a year that you learn how to handle storms. Write this down. The 10 purposes for a storm. What's the reason for a storm? Number one, they come to restore natural balance. Number two, they come to cleanse the environment. Number three, they come to remove pollution. There's some people in your life that storms will get rid of. Some folks only with you because you got money now, you know. But when your storm of brokenness hit you, everybody gone. And you find out who your true friends are. Everybody clap right there. You know who I'm talking about. All of a sudden, they're gone. I call them pollution. Every time a hurricane leaves the Bahamas, the air is pure. The wind is clean. The water is beautiful. Why? Because hurricanes come to clean out pollution. Number four, storms come to expose decay. Number five, it comes to test your strength. Number six, it comes to maintain humility. Number seven, storms come to reduce life to the essentials. Number eight, storms come to test your foundation. Someone, a lady said to me the other day, she said, Pastor Miles, my light been off for five months. I said, what? She said, yep. And she said, I finally got back to getting used to lamp and candle. I said, my dear. She said, she said, no, feel sorry for me. I forgot what it felt like to read by a kerosene lamp. God will send and allow storms to bring you back to the essentials. Don't curse the storm. Number eight, storms come to test your foundation. Number nine, they come to test your building code. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. There are a lot of homes in the Bahamas that didn't build by the code. You all know some of them. And when hurricanes come, hurricanes expose them right away. They're the first ones to go. Well, your life is that way. If you ain't built by God's code, when the storms of life come, we see you exposed. And number 10, storms come to give you a key. What's this key? I found a key. Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 says, I will give you what? The keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he says, I will give you the secrets of the kingdom of God. Only you will have the secrets to be able to control the environment on earth. He's talking about kingdom people. Let's talk about one of these keys that I, I, I want to just share with you today. Matthew 7 says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on what? The rock. The rains came down, the streams rose up, the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, I want you to check the next verse. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who also built his house but on sand. The rains came down and the steams rose up and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell with a great crash. 
Now here's the point I want you to learn from this. And Jesus Christ is speaking something very important here. First of all, storms are natural to life. He's saying, look, they come to everybody. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I must be sinning because things are getting tough. No, no. Storms come whether you're sinning or not sinning. Whether you build on sand or rock, the storms come to both houses. Write this down, number two. Storms must be expected. Christ was saying, look, whether you're in a secure house or a shaky house, the storm don't care. It's coming. Expect the storms to come. Number three, storms come to everyone. Sometimes we think we are so unique. I'm the only one going, listen, you don't understand. The folks behind you got ten times more problems than you have. Everybody will face storms. That's what Christ is saying. Whether you are built on the rock or the sand, the storms come against you. Number four, storms impact everyone. Number five, storms are not the issue in life. And I thought it was important to remember. Because if storms hit everybody, then the storm is not the issue. Let me say it slow. If the storm hits everybody, then the issue in life is not storms. Don't worry about the storm. It coming anyhow. You got to focus on something else. In other words, storms come to expose what you built on. So the most important thing in life in 212 is not how many storms are coming. You got to focus on, am I built in the right way? The, in other words, the structure is more important than the storm. That's why God brought you here tonight. He brought you here to tell you that there are going to be a whole lot of storms more frequently in 2012. But I'm going to give you the key, he says. The key to rising above the storm of life is to secure your building code, your foundation and your material that you built out of. I have no fear of storms. No fear of anything in 212. Why? Because it ain't a storm that's the problem. It's whether I am built on the right foundation and got the right material and got the right code. If you don't have the right stuff, he says, there will be a great crash. You fall apart. In other words, you are never remembered by what you avoided in life. You are remembered by what you what? Survived. Never trust the person who ain't been through no storm. I will never forget when I read Bill Gates' book. I will never forget it. They asked Mr. Gates, how do you... He said, they said, what's the secret to your success in Microsoft? He said, the managers. They said, how do you hire managers? He said, I interviewed them myself. They said... What's the process? He says, well, I interview managers and I ask them the basic questions. He said, but there's one question I reserve at the end. And if they get this right, I hire them. If they get it wrong, I don't hire them. They said, what's the question? He said, the question I always ask them is this. Have you ever failed before? Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever had a collapse in your work life. He said, if they say no, I don't hire them. I don't trust anyone, he says, who ain't been through a storm. Why? Because you are not remembered by what you avoided. How do we know David? Goliath. How do we know Joshua? The wall. How do we know Samson? The Philistines. How we know Moses? Pharaoh. If you ain't got no problem, you ain't got no reputation. What made Mandela famous? Jail. What made Martin King, King Jr. famous? Jail and hoses and dogs. Listen, why don't you give yourself a great opportunity to become famous next year? Invite some storms to come into your life and show them how bad you are. Just show them how I'm going to stand. And after having done all, I'm going to stand. <laughs> Never trust a person who ain't survived nothing. Everybody could brag, but a few of them can testify. Let me tell you something about the eagle. The eagle is the only bird that looks for storms. And it's the only bird that God identified with. 
The eagle is a strange bird, and he's the king of birds. Here's why. Number one, the eagle is the king of birds because the eagle understands storms. Secondly, thirdly, the eagle looks for storms. It's the only bird that looks for storms. He, in the desert, you see an eagle gliding high looking for storms, sandstorms and, and cyclones. Why? Because the eagle welcomes storms. Why? Because the eagle flies toward the storms when he sees it. Now, why would you do that? The answer is very simple. The eagle uses the storm to increase height. Number, number seven, the eagle uses the storm to rest. The eagle wing can be seven feet span. And when an eagle sees a storm, he goes into the storm, he lets the current of the storm push him up higher, and then he sets his pinions and he rests on the top of the storm. When the storm is present, the eagle rests. I'm an eagle. Number eight, the eagle uses the storm to cleanse its feathers. All the dust in the desert gets clogged in the feathers and the eagle goes into the storm and the velocity of the wind blows the dust away. In other words, it uses the storm for cleansing. The eagle also uses the storm to test their pinions. That's the bone, a little bone in their wing that they set. They have to test it on a storm to see if it's locked and they just rest. And number 10, eagles let the storm leave when they finish using it. 2012, I want you to use every storm that comes. Someone just say amen right there. And I want you to tell the storm, I'm going to use you to go higher in faith. And I'm going to lock my faith on you. And I'm going to rest in the God who is the God of the storm. And when I finish using you, I'm going to let you just go on by. This is why you have to learn how storms work. Eagles do not fear storms. And I challenge you to be like an eagle. Because eagles are the most successful birds in the world. Now let me close with this. Nothing is permanent except God. We got to get this settled for 2012. God promises that nothing is permanent. But only God is permanent. Look at Ecclesiastes again. God says to everything there's what? A season. That means nothing is forever. If you got plenty now, that ain't forever. If you ain't got nothing now, that ain't forever. If you up now, that ain't forever. If you down now, that ain't forever. Everything is seasonal. So don't panic in the seasons. You got to find something that doesn't change. There are two things that doesn't change. One, God, and two, his promises. But the problem is, God promises change. So his promises are true, including the one that says nothing will remain the same. And so God has a plan for your life. And I'm putting it to you, friends, that God is unchanging. Look at James 1, verse 16. Write it down. It says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above, from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He is permanent. Another verse, Psalm 145, 13 says, you, your kingdom, O God, is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving to all he has made. God says, my promises are stable. I like this one, James 1, 20, 1 verse 2 rather. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face the storms, so many kinds, because you know now, this is amazing. The only way to face storms with joy is you got to know something. If you don't know something, then you can't be joyful in the storm. But what do you got to know? First of all, he says you got to know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work in your life so that you may be mature and complete. And not lacking anything. The only way to live a life of no lack is to be tested by storms. And he says, have pure joy when they come. Because you know that this storm is going to leave you a better person, a stronger person, with more stable perseverance. Can I hear an amen? Tell your neighbor, I'm in the classroom right now of perseverance. In other words, don't leave the class. Stay in the class. Until perseverance has its complete work. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Deuteronomy 32 says, For the Lord's portion is this people, his people. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle stirs her nest and hovers over her young and spreads his wings to catch them and carries them on his pinions. The Lord alone will lead you. Listen, eagles only use their pinions in a storm. God says, I'm going to carry you on my pinions. Which means that God will let you fall in the storm. And then he'll catch you, he says. But he ain't going to leave the storm. He can be in the storm with you. And both he and you are going to use the storm to carry you higher. He can put you on his pinions, he says. And he's going to show you how to use your pinions. He's going to train you how to handle storms himself. He went through so you can go through. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, let me put this to you in a very simple way. Luke 23, Jesus says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've already prayed for your faith that it fail not. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. In other words, you ain't qualified to help nobody else until you survive something, he told Peter. Tell your neighbor, you ain't know nothing until you've been through something. Hit him, tell him again, you ain't know nothing until you've been through something. If you've been through something, clap your hands. Thank God you made it through. Your testimony. I put, this, uh, I put this to rest tonight. Ten keys to rising above the storm. You want to write these down and keep them in the front of your house, your refrigerator, and your workplace. This is what I use to make it through my storms. Number one, believe you are built for storms. The eagle believes he can handle a storm. He's built for it. Number two, know that storms are natural. Stop being shocked that things are tough. Can I say it again? Stop being shocked that things are tough. Stop being shocked that you lost your job. Stop being shocked that the business is going through a tough time. Why? Storms are natural. Number three, you must understand the nature of storms. That's why I'm teaching it tonight. Number four, do not curse the storm. You can spend your whole year getting mad at something that happened. And so you waste all your energy on madness. Instead of using your energy on progress. Don't curse the storm. Understand it and use it. Number five, use the storm to test your true self. Number six, let the storms expand the limits of your potential. Number seven, Use the storm to rest and test your faith in God. You know why God will strip you? So you can trust him. God will bring you to everything zero. You know, Job's story is a good job. Satan said to Job, I mean to, to God, let me take everything from Job and he'll curse you. God said, okay, go ahead and try. I know my servant Job. That's not in the Bible. God says, I know my servant Job. I know the guy. Why? I don't test him already. Satan says, okay, watch him. I'm going to take everything. Let me take everything. God, okay, you, you can take everything, but don't touch his life. And the guy lost. His, fo his farm went into foreclosure. All the children died. His body was struck with boils and sickness and disease. All the cattle died. All that he had was gone. And his wife was mad at him. You can't get no worse than that in life. Everything gone. And then the wife turned around and said, why don't you curse God and die? This God who you claim to serve, look what he let happen to you. Some of you all feel away tonight. This God who you've been giving tithes to and giving offerings to and you've been going to prayer meeting. How come all this stuff is happening? Hey, storms are natural. And storms come to test your faith in God. Matter of fact, storms will come to remove your faith out of your boss. It'll take your faith out of your company. It puts it back where it belongs. In God. And number eight, let the storms clean out your relationships and your habits. There's some bad habits that can only be broken by a storm. Well, I ain't spoken no more. Why? The, the, the doctors say I got, you know, lung cancer. You were trying to stop smoking for 20 years. And one announcement from a doctor, you stop overnight. Bam, finish. 
The storm will break a habit. Don't curse the storm. And number 10, let the storm drive you closer to divine material. Because you want to build your house on the right foundation. Which is the word of God and a prayer life with God. I challenge you tonight as we change this great, beautiful year that get yourself ready for some storms that are going to hit you. Every prediction I have seen is not positive. And I put it to you. And number 10, see the storm as a messenger from God to bring glory to himself. How can that be? Here's a verse that I always live by. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation or storm has seized you except that which is what? Common to all men. In other words, your storm ain't special. The next verse. And God is faithful. When the storm comes, he says, he will not allow you to be what? Tested beyond what you can bear. Tell your neighbor, that's deep. Let me tell you what that means. That means whatever you face in 2012, God allowed it because God knows you the same way he knows Job. Let me say it again. Whatever you face in 2012, it doesn't matter. If it's a big one, that means God thinks big of you. Why? He won't allow you to face what you are not able to overcome. So if, you, if he allows it, he trusts you. A storm is a message from God about what he thinks about you. <laughs> if you got a broke toe and you think that's a big deal, then God thinks you only get handle a broke toe. But if you lost your leg, God said that you can handle leg loss. And if you lost your house, God said you, you can handle a lost house. Why? I got another one coming bigger than that. In other words, every storm that comes... It's God saying to you, go girl, you can handle this. Come on, son, you can handle this. I won't allow it if you couldn't handle it. That means if it comes, you got what it takes to overcome it. Give God a hand for the ability to overcome storms. <laughs> Hallelujah. I put it to you then that God has an answer. You must remember this. Give yourself back to God. And I put it to you as my encouragement to you. On this great last opportunity that you have to remember these simple statements. One, initiate the solutions to storms next year. Don't wait. And I think Pastor Dave said it tonight. Don't sit around and wait for somebody to approve what you're about to do. God will tell you what to do in a storm. Number two, place demands on your own potential. Initiate your own development. Number three, test the creativity of your mind. God will give you stress to stretch your mind. Or you will allow stress so you can think bigger. Number four, believe in your ability to solve problems. And look at what you have. You got more than you think you have. And number six, study what you have. Number seven, see potential in the resources around you. Number eight, see beyond what's normal in your life. Number nine, understand the true nature of what you have in your life. There are people and things and products that you have that will transform what you have. And number ten, act on faith. 2012 is a year that you're going to have to depend on heaven more than earth. I'm going to repeat this, 2012 will be a year that you will have to depend on heaven more than earth. I say it for the third time. God is telling us, 2012 will have so many storms that you're going to depend on heaven more than earth. But the good news is, God knows you are an eagle.
I want you right now to know that God's plans for your life are intact. The scripture that we read tonight, I want you to read it aloud with me, please. This is how we're going to manage our time. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Read it aloud, please. Go. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Reach over, take somebody's hands. Tell your neighbor, I'm supporting your plan. Let's hold hands together. We're going to face 2012 together. We've got five minutes before the hour. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And surrender all your plans to God. Lights, please. Please look at the screens. We've got one minute. 2011 is history. The storms of 2011 are over. Fifty-five seconds to 2012. Thirty seconds, 2012. Time is gone. You'll never see 2011 again until you stand before the judgment seat. 10 seconds before 2012. 8, 7, 6, 5. Let us pray.